someone eats a starchy, sugary meal, blood glucose levels will climb very rapidly. That is uh, a lethal situation, actually. And, and it, you can die from what can happen with that uh, chronically elevated glucose because of what's going on at the kidneys. And so insulin comes in from the pancreas into the blood to save the day. It basically opens doors in certain cells throughout the body, like muscle and fat cells, for that glucose to come from the blood into those cells, thereby lowering glucose. And then insulin, having done its job, retreats back into the background. However, that fails to um, highlight the fact that insulin has an effect on literally every single cell in the body. Every cell in the body has little doors that insulin can come and knock on and thus tell the cell to do something. The theme of what insulin does, if we tried to distill all of its thousands of chemical reactions to one central idea is insulin tells cells what to do with energy. Um, some cells, it tells it to take in energy like the muscle and the fat cells, but every other cell, uh, it still tells the cell what to do with the energy that it has, what to do with amino acids and glucose and fats and ketones and lactate. It, it dictates energy use at every cell and thus um, by extension, it dictates energy use in the entire body. The average individual is coming to their physician visit once a year, and at every single visit, they will get their glucose numbers and then a bunch of lipid numbers, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides, and that'll, that'll almost be the end of it. Unfortunately, at no point has the word insulin ever entered into this conversation with, between patient and clinician, but the, the tragedy there is that someone could be coming into these doctor appointments year after year over decades and the glucose is always normal. And so the physician or the clinic is never thinking that there is any hint of a metabolic problem. But in reality, insulin has been climbing steadily throughout every year at every visit. It's just evidence of the person's mounting insulin resistance. They have several times more insulin than they did. It's not working as well in controlling glucose, but they have so much that it works well enough and the glucose is staying in check. And it's only once the body has reached this, if you will, maximal point of insulin resistance, now the glucose starts to climb. And then we detect the problem with conventional thinking because we look at everything through the lens of glucose. So someone could be coming to the doctor and their glucose numbers, numbers may look normal, but they're gaining a little weight or let's say that their blood pressure is climbing and blood pressure is one of the most common consequences of hypertension, or it's a man and he's worried about erectile dysfunction, or the woman is worried about polycystic ovary syndrome, the most common forms of infertility. And those are both very intimately derived from insulin resistance. So their glucose is normal. The physician says, well, you're not really on the spectrum of type 2 diabetes. But if, they, if we were to pause that conversation and look at insulin, then we would say, oh, my heavens, your, your insulin is five times higher than it ought to be. Um, that's, that's a red flag. Now, having said all of that, um, what could someone do? If someone had immediate access to their blood lipids or their conventional um, clinical blood measurements, Glucose won't tell you too much. I would say look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Take your triglyceride number, divide it by your HDL cholesterol number. And if that number, if that, that, that um, answer is less than 1.5, that's a very good sign that the person is insulin sensitive and they're, and they're doing well and they have a low risk of heart disease. You'd mentioned that sometimes people will adopt a low carb diet <clears throat> What will very, very, very often happen, triglycerides will plummet, HDL will go up. Those are two very, very good changes by, by any definition, even dogmatic conventional thinking would say that's a good change. What may happen in some is LDL will stay or go up. And that will be that will commonly be flagged um, because, because conventional thinking looks at LDL as this um, evil that by, by all means must be expunged and must be pushed down to as low a number as possible. And that is absolutely not true. LDL alone has almost no predictive value when it comes to understanding someone's heart disease risk. And in contrast, there is exceedingly clear evidence that people, as we get older, people with the lowest cholesterol levels 
uh, die sooner. And in the, the converse, people with the highest cholesterol live longer. And, and the lower, especially LDL levels, um, it increases people's risk of dying from infections by like 15 times. That's a phenomenal increase in risk of, of serious infections, as well as blood-based cancers like leukemia and lymphoma. So LDL is an extraordinarily protective molecule. It's, it's very much a part of the immune system that's very overlooked, unfortunately. And I'm not saying LDL has no relevance to health, but I am saying to look at LDL alone simply gives you almost no real value. If, if someone is adopting a low carbohydrate diet and they really wanna get a feel, for their what their blood lipids can tell them look at the triglyceride to hdl ratio and i guarantee it will start to go down with the adoption of a low carb diet as insulin comes down those blood lipids get better oh it, yeah certainly by the time someone's noticing their glucose levels creeping up into the low the low hundreds 110 one teen, 100 teens etc it's extraordinarily likely that they have been fighting this battle of insulin resistance in other words elevated insulin um, for, for 10 to 20 years. Yeah. The, the best way would be to convince your clinician to measure insulin. Mm -hmm. If someone could go in for their next appointment and just say, I really want my insulin measured as a part of this, this blood panel that you're measuring, you're getting glucose, you're getting lipids. Maybe they're getting a few other hormones, um, to do like a thyroid check or et, et cetera. Say, could you please just check that insulin box? and measure my insulin levels. Uh, very, very often it, it can be done and insurance will cover it. It's just even physicians, the average physician just simply won't think about it, let alone the patient. So the patient needs to be very well, politely aggressive and saying, please check that box. And if a person does have their insulin levels and they, this is in the US, so the kind of US units here, if your insulin, if your fasting insulin is six micro units per mil or under, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. an extremely good sign that you're very insulin sensitive. If it's um, up into the teens, kind of high teens, that's a you know a warning sign. There might be a problem. And then if it's into the twenties and beyond, I would say that's almost definitely a problem. I I, I I give that little wiggle room into the into the teens because insulin, like every hormone, has its own rhythm where it will ebb and flow. And it's possible someone catches it at a high point, putting them let's say into the high teens. But then all the more reason to look at that insulin level and temper or balance it out by looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio. If that ratio is less than 1.5 and your insulin is say 15, I would say the insulin's higher than you'd like, but we likely, if your triglyceride to HDL ratio is one, which is great, you, we very likely just caught your insulin at a peak and it's actually good. I think a typical course of treatment would be that the diabetic, the person progressing towards type two diabetes would be coming in and their glucose levels are into the higher kind of mid hundreds perhaps, or maybe not even that high. And they would be given a, a therapy like metformin as a first step. And then like all drugs that has diminishing returns and they, it, if still with metformin, insulin is staying into the hundreds, then it would be something like, all right, let's progress to, to insulin. And insulin works. And let me elaborate. So the paradigm was, as I outlined, where a person has been living a life of elevated insulin, and now the glucose starts to climb. And because we look at type 2 diabetes as a glucose-centric problem, the average clinician will say, well, I don't, even, I don't care what the insulin levels are. I don't even know what insulin levels are. Let's just put you on insulin therapy. Now we're going to push your insulin to a super physiological level and it works at lowering the glucose. Glucose comes down and because that is the clinical metric of interest, that would be considered a success. But the great tragedy in that paradigm is the person is already swimming in a sea of insulin and not to get into a different topic, but the chronically elevated insulin is a large contributed, uh, contributor to the insulin resistance in the first place. Giving a type 2 diabetic insulin and hoping it will treat their problem is like giving an alcoholic another glass of wine. In both instances, you're giving them more of the very thing that's causing the problem. Mm -hmm. So in type 2 diabetes, which at its foundation is a disease of insulin resistance, which is almost in very large part caused by the chronically elevated insulin itself by dumping more insulin into the system. And this is what happens. We make the type two diabetic fatter and sicker. And this has been measured. There is no clinical outcome 
that is favorably impacted by giving a type two diabetic insulin other than you lower their glucose, but we lower their glucose levels, but they get fatter and they get sicker. The more aggressively a type two diabetic is using insulin to treat their glucose or to, to lower their glucose, they have significant like multiples, two or to three times higher risk of dying from heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, let alone gaining 20 pounds over, over six months. Giving a type two diabetic insulin is a wonderful way to make them fat and sick and kill them faster. There's just no other way to say it. I don't think it's bad. Um, and I say that just because we know there are people who do that, like individuals who actually adhere to very, very strict ketogenic diets in order to control their epilepsy. For example, I know people who adhere to it in order to control migraines, where the moment they get off a ketogenic diet, they get really um, debilitating migraine headaches. And I, I know of no negative consequences in these people. So I would say you can certainly adhere to a strict ketogenic diet long-term. And if you do have that reverse metabolic inflexibility, it doesn't matter because you're doing it in a state of low insulin and that low insulin is going to keep you healthy and lean at the risk of oversimplifying disease. However, for the rest of us that adhere to a low carb diet to, to just be lean and healthy, you know, my priority is to be a healthy involved dad and in someday um, to be a healthy involved grandpa. I'm kind of thinking long-term, I want that. Um, I want to be that kind of grandpa. That's why I adhere to a low carb diet, but I also live in a family and we have carbohydrates around. I end up adhering to what some would call a cyclical ketogenic diet. Um, not because I feel a compulsion to sprinkle in carbs. It's just the practical way of doing it for me in my home where I am very, very strict with every breakfast for myself. I'm very strict with every lunch for myself. And at dinner, depending on what the family is eating for dinner, I will be a little more liberal with carbohydrates. Um, the fact that it keeps me a little more metabolically, genuinely flexible, shifting between the fuels, that's nice, but I don't, I, that doesn't worry me necessarily. However, I Maybe having said all of this, the person who's adhering to a very strict ketogenic diet and then they have one horrific cheat day or cheat meal, I do think I do think that can have negative consequences. A paper was just published last week, which took people, this was a randomized double blind controlled trial. So it, it is powerful in that regard. And its conclusions can be looked at as, as very authoritative. They took people with diagnosed confirmed um, fatty liver disease the most common liver problem. And the only intervention was to have one group eating less fructose. And they had much more substantial, significant improvements in fatty liver disease. So I do think we ought to be scrutinizing insulin. And I would say, never drink your fruits, eat them. Don't drink fruit, eat, eat it. First order, my sentiment is always, whatever the carbs are, let them be fruits and vegetables. That's sort of, and, and done. Those are your carbs. And the next order thinking is, is would progress to um, vegetables that grow above the ground and the, and avoiding the tropical fruits, um, pineapples, mangoes, you know, these more sugary fruits. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe at that same order of thinking, it's really to focus on the least sugary fruits like berries. And I think citrus would qualify as well. Those are the nice ones. There is without a doubt, protein has an insulinogenic effect. There is an insulin response to, to protein. When you eat that protein with fat, however, it is blunted. You've mitigated that somewhat. So all the more reason to eat that protein with fat as nature always has the two come together, always. Uh, well, unless it's a, a fruit oil like avocados or olives, which is fine. Those are fine. Um, but, but focus on that protein and fat. And in the context of a low carbohydrate diet, the insulin response to that protein is significantly less than it is if you're eating protein in the context of a high carbohydrate diet, and then to bring in this new character, glucagon, glucagon will act somewhat as the opposite. It's the, it's the yin and the yang of metabolic regulation. What insulin is telling a cell to do, glucagon is commonly telling the cell to do the opposite. And so what happens in a low carbohydrate diet with the consumption of protein, you do get a modest insulin effect, but it is matched by an equal or greater glucagon effect. And so I introduced this concept, newly introduced, although it's an old idea, of the insulin to glucagon ratio, in that where that ratio is staying similar to a fasting level, 
then don't worry about what it's going to do to your ketones or don't worry about what insulin is going to do at the fat cell because glucagon is there to keep insulin's effects in check. It's there mm -hmm. to counter insulin. And, and so that was the gist of it. So glucagon is a hormone that stimulates ketogenesis. It stimulates lipolysis. It does all these things that we want within reason, of course, but it's, it's just acting as a balance. Yeah. Um, what insulin. causes it to rise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Typically the most potent stimulus is, is the opposite of what insulin's stimulus is. Insulin is stimulated with elevated glucose. Glucagon is stimulated by low glucose. So mm -hmm. anyone who's adhering to a low carb diet or fasting, their glucagon levels will absolutely be elevated. And, and that's necessary. It's helping the body mobilize energy including the breakdown of glucose from the liver and the production of new glucose, activating gluconeogenesis. Control carbohydrates, and we've talked about that now. Focus on the least starchy, least sugary carbohydrates like fruits and vegetables. Number two, prioritize protein. Make sure you're eating enough protein and you're getting from the best sources, namely animal protein. Nowadays, we are inundated with plant proteins. You walk through a grocery store, I walk through Costco and some of the first pallets I see are these plant-based proteins. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. We are obsessed with plant-based proteins and that is to our detriment. Anyone listening who's flirting with plant-based proteins, stop wasting your money. So you're gonna not be getting the balance of amino acids that you need, but you also don't absorb them as well. So you're, it's another level of you not getting the nourishment you think you are. And, and this is quantified in humans. We know in humans that the best proteins are egg, meat, and dairy. Any plant protein is far below that. Part of the problem with plant proteins is that every plant protein contains things called anti-nutrients. I'm not making that up. It seems like it's a, a mythical term. <clears throat> it's not. Every plant protein ends up getting enriched in these molecules that inhibit the digestion of the protein from that plant. And these are things like phytic acids, tannins, trypsin inhibitors. I invite anyone to, to after this discussion, to go look these up. All plant proteins have these. They, and they have to try to overcome what's, what the plant is trying to do, which is stop you from eating it. And, and so don't eat me because you're not going to get any nutritional value. And, and then second... What is overlooked, but this was confirmed by a group called the Clean Label Project, plant proteins contain heavy metals like lead and arsenic. And this is a consequence of doing something that is a little unnatural. For example, peas are incredibly deficient in protein. If you're trying to get a serving of protein from peas, you've got to take a thousand peas and refine it, refine it in order to get that protein. In the process of concentrating these peas, the protein is what you want. What you don't want is the minerals that are naturally enriched in peas. When you eat a handful of peas, it's, it's an insignificant amount. But when you've concentrated a thousand peas, now you're getting potentially unhealthy levels of lead and arsenic. And this is what this Clean Label Project, this third party group confirmed in plant proteins. You just don't get those in animal proteins. The magic of the animal is that those sorts of things have been worked out through the animal in different mechanisms. Don't fear fat. Protein and fat come together in nature, eat fat, and, uh, and not only does fat help the protein digest better, it does. When someone eats fat with protein, the, um, the, the, the digestive mechanisms of digesting fat, the bile acids actually help digest. It, it improves the breakdown of the protein as well. So people will commonly say, I can't eat a whey shake or something, it upsets my stomach. And I will always say, well, what if you mix that whey with some fat? And I believe a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein is what's ideal in that regard. And almost always the person finds that they handle the protein just fine. So fat helps the protein to digest better. Fat and protein together are more anabolic than protein alone. That's also confirmed in humans. Also, the magic of fat is that fat has no insulin effect. And so when you look at human health through the lens that I do, which is how can I keep my insulin low while nourishing my body to live a long, healthy, lean life? then fat is valuable. Don't fear being liberal with fat when you're adding it to your protein, especially, you know, especially if someone's eating a lean meat like chicken, you put some butter or some olive oil on that. Fat and protein are supposed to come together. So those are the rules. Control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat. Every one of those four disorders I just mentioned where the guy's taking separate medications to treat, every one of them has a profoundly relevant connection to insulin resistance. And so the person who would read the book, and in my mind, I would imagine 
he starts to challenge this idea that they're each separate disorders and say, well, to varying degrees, they're all coming from insulin resistance. And then the next question would be, how can I improve my insulin resistance? That is not going to be based on a drug. If you want to improve your insulin resistance, it is a lifestyle disease. The diet, the food that we eat is either the culprit or the cure. It's that food that got you where you are. And it's the it's a different type of food that's going to get you back to where you want to get, improving your insulin resistance. And honestly, eventually in those instances of those four medications, possibly getting off of every one of them. Without a doubt, we have to account for energy. I'm, you know, and for heaven's sakes, you know, I appreciate that as well or more than most. My PhD was bioenergetics, which is the actual use of energy in living organisms. So calories matter, but I also think there's something absolutely foolish, if not totally ignorant, in attempting to fit a biological model into um, the, the, the perfect um, binary view of thermodynamics in the realm of physics. Mm -hmm. I think that is, I think that is wrong. Uh, and to, to look at protein, for example, and say protein is four calories per gram, that's the same as a carbohydrate BS. It's not comparable. There is without a doubt in organisms, hormones play a part. It is, it is physically impossible for a fat cell to get big unless insulin is elevated. Now, of course, you must have sufficient calories to fuel that fat cell growth. So calories matter as well. But in contrast, if insulin is low, there is no choice but fat cells to shrink. And one of the most obvious examples is type 1 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, a person can be eating 4,000 calories per day, and they may be excreting 500 of it as glucose from the urine, but that in no way accounts for all the calories. They cannot get fat, and in contrast, they cannot stay fat, which is why type 1 diabetics learn early on, unfortunately, that they can eat anything they want. And if they deliberately underdose their insulin, they will stay as skinny as they want. Now it's not healthy, it's not healthy at all in that mm -hmm. instance, but, but they've learned that insulin is the absolute controller of fat cell growth or shrinking, yeah. you know, one way or the other, it has its hand on that lever. But again, if insulin is trying to stimulate a fat cell to grow, you have to have sufficient energy to be pulling into that fat cell to feed that fat cell growth. I just simply say, it's not just calories. We have to consider the insulin, but because that view is still so counterintuitive and challenges the dogmatic view that it is purely calories, I, I end up saying that side louder. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like I'm just an insulin guy. When in reality, I realize that energy must be accounted for, but attempting to perfectly balance calories, you're doomed because yeah. it fails to acknowledge um, the nuances of eating food. Like, you know, protein has such a high thermic effect of eating it that giving it a comparable caloric value to glucose is asinine. It's absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculous. In contrast, if insulin levels are elevated, that physically slows metabolic rate. In contrast, if insulin levels are low, metabolic rate accelerates. And this can shift by as much mm -hmm. as 300 calories per day, as David Ludwig published about two years ago from Harvard. But insulin tells the body what to do with energy not that it's creating it or destroying it without, you know, with want and abandon. No, that energy must be accounted for. It's just that we, we cannot in, in the average individual account for all calorie, what it does when we eat it, as well as what's happening when we expend it. A person may change their diet and their metabolic rate changes that is confirmed or alternatively, they're in ketosis and now they're breathing out ketones and urinating out ketones. Every ketone is a piece of fat that in this instance didn't have to be burned as energy going up or exercising. They just simply wasted it from the body. And how is the average person attempting to track those that wasted energy? Ketosis wastes energy, which is a great thing. Ketones are fatty acids, which are expelled from the body through sweat or urine without having to be burned. I would say someone who is looking at Keto Connect and wanting to make a diet change, I think there's tremendous value in doing exactly what you said. Don't count your calories, just focus on your macros. That is without a doubt going to bump you down a significant amount of weight. Once you've come to that new plateau, if you're not where you think you should be, then it's perhaps time to start scrutinizing calorie number. But that to me is not the first 
that's not the place to start because if you start a dietary intervention with hunger, which is what calorie counting is going to lead to, at least initially, you're doomed. Hunger will always win. So become a fat burner, start to rely on your own fat for fuel, and you're going to be less hungry. You'll naturally start controlling your appetite better. We did this study here in my lab in rodents when we artificially inflated insulin, uh, elevated insulin, metabolic rate was was significantly reduced. And then, like I said, David Ludwig did this in in, in humans look, by giving them meals that would spike their insulin or wouldn't and seeing these a change in metabolic rate to the tune of about 300 calories per day.